Robert Strecker, AIDS is a man-made, genetically engineered virus that was either accidentally or deliberately introduced into the world's population. AIDS is not a homosexual disease. AIDS is not a venereal disease. AIDS did not originate from the green monkey. AIDS is not prevented by the use of condoms. And AIDS is not likely to ever be cured by a vaccine. I realize what you've just heard contradicts most of what you've been told about AIDS. In this program, Dr. Robert Strecker will present documented evidence that refutes the official stand taken by so-called AIDS experts, members of the research community, and the government. And now, let's find out the truth about AIDS. I'm Dr. Robert Strucker, a practicing internist and gastroenterologist in Los Angeles. I have a special interest in pharmacology, pathology, and now AIDS. I became interested in the AIDS question several years ago in doing a health maintenance proposal, basically an insurance proposal, for Security Pacific Bank, a bank here in California. More and more members of the medical and research community, such as Dr. Peter Duesberg, the University of California at Berkeley, Dr. John Seal, a member of the Royal Society of Medicine of London, and Dr. Alan Cantwell, who has recently finished the third book on AIDS, this one on the origin of AIDS, are questioning the validity of the popular view about AIDS, which has failed to scientifically explain the disease. So I've decided it's time that someone tells you the truth about AIDS, so in this program, I will show you how the AIDS virus was actually predicted, requested, produced, deployed, and now threatens the very existence of mankind because it works. To understand why I believe that the AIDS virus came out of a laboratory rather than out of the jungles of Africa, you have to understand several important concepts which I will address in the next few minutes. These concepts actually include an understanding of, of viruses, bacteria, human cell lines, tissue culture, and manipulation of all of those things in the laboratory. In the first question about the AIDS virus, in addressing what the AIDS virus is, the virus has a morphology, something of this form, which is actually a so-called D-type retrovirus. So what are viruses? Some people say that viruses are the smallest replicating microorganisms. Some people say that viruses are bad news in a sugar coat. Actually, in the case of a retrovirus, the AIDS virus, which is R-E-T-R-O, retrovirus, what does this mean? Viruses in general are thought to be the smallest replicating organisms that require other cells to grow themselves in. Viruses are not capable of reproducing themselves on their own outside of living tissue is the dogma of the scientists today. Viruses must inhabit another cell for eventual growth and reproduction. Bacteria, fungi, and some other organisms actually are capable of growing outside of tissue. In other words, they don't have to inhibit or inhabit other tissue to reproduce themselves. They can grow on tissue culture plates, such as bacteria. But viruses must grow inside of tissue, which requires that there be living human or animal tissue for them to replicate in. Now, if we look at the word retrovirus, we know that this is a small self-replicating uh, organism which grows inside of living tissue. Now, what does the term retro stand for? The term retro, in the case of this virus, stands for the fact that contained within the AIDS virus and other so-called human retroviruses or other animal retroviruses are small enzymes known as reverse transcriptase. That is where the word retro comes from. The reverse transcriptase, which is the RE, comes from reverse, and the TRO tra comes from transcriptase. That is an enzyme in the AIDS virus which actually is responsible for duplication of the genes of the AIDS virus, which are in an RNA form, different than human form. Human genetic material is in a DNA form. So if the AIDS virus is in to insert itself in the human material, somehow after infection of the cell, what happens is this enzyme duplicates the RNA of the AIDS virus into a DNA form and actually inserts that into the human DNA. If you have an example, here's a cell, and inside this cell, here's a human DNA. 
What happens is the AIDS virus genes get in and are actually duplicated into DNA form copied by the reverse transcriptase. That information is then inserted into the genetic makeup of the human cell. This is a now an AIDS virus residing in the human genes, which then sends out a signal for production of a new AIDS virus. So the RNA is the genetic information of all retroviruses. It's copied into the DNA form by reverse transcriptase, inserted into the genes, and subsequent production of new virus. To better understand this subject and to help us appreciate the importance of Dr. Strecker's work, I'm going to briefly clarify and emphasize some of the information in this presentation. Virology is the study of viruses. It deals with tiny living organisms visible only with the use of the most powerful electron microscopes. In fact, hundreds of thousands of AIDS viruses can easily fit on the head of a pin. What makes the AIDS virus particularly deadly is its ability to not only invade and neutralize human cells, but the virus's ability to put its own genetic material inside the human cell's genetic structure, thereby allowing the virus to use the human cell as a kind of virus factory, reproducing more viruses from the human cell's raw materials. Unlike larger organisms like bacteria, viruses do not respond to conventional medical treatment, much like the common cold virus cannot be treated effectively by drugs. Now, how does this AIDS virus, which is a human retrovirus of the D type, how does this virus affect humans? Basically, the immune system of humans is broken down into two parts. It's very simple. One is called B cells, and one is called T cells. B cells are derived from the bursa of Fabricius, but the easy way to remember B is that they control basically production of antibodies and control bacterial infections, therefore B, rather than versa, you can think of it as bacteria. T cell systems control a, a opportunistic infections such as pneumocystis crony pneumonia, the production of cancers like Kaposi sarcoma, and other microorganisms such as tuberculosis. So that if you wiped out the T cell system, you could see the arisal of opportunistic infections such as pneumocystic crony pneumonia, a hallmark of AIDS, Kaposi sarcoma, an alleged sarcoma and another hallmark of AIDS, or other diseases. If you wiped out the B system, you would have trouble protecting yourself against bacteria and perhaps in developing antibodies. Now, in the case of the AIDS virus, the AIDS virus, once it infects the human body, selectively destroys the T4 cells of the human body. The T4 cells are a division of the T lymphocytic system, the one that helps us control cancers, fungi, pneumocystis crony pneumonia, and other organisms. The AIDS virus selectively leads to the destruction of those cells. If you look at the overall incidence of these new so-called human retroviruses, you'll discover the following. First, there is HTLV-1, a new human retrovirus which is responsible for T-cell leukemia. There is HTLV2, which has this appearance, which is responsible for the development of hairy cell leukemia. And we have HTLV3, which looks like this. These are the best known so far, which is the AIDS virus, responsible for AIDS. Now, interestingly enough, when you put these viruses into tissue culture, what happens? This virus is proliferative in tissue culture. It makes things grow. It's not surprising, therefore, that you might see the arisal of a T-cell leukemia because the virus's very nature is to make the cells proliferate. This virus is proliferative in tissue culture, results in humans in the development of hairy cell leukemia, and again, by its basic proliferative nature in tissue culture, it's not surprising that you can see a rising hairy cell leukemia. This virus in tissue culture is destructive. It was one of the reasons that they had trouble getting enough of the virus because suppose this was a tissue culture. Every time they put in the AIDS virus, what would happen was they'd come back in a few days and the tissue culture would be dead. Basically, there would be left uh, just debris with very little virus, no living cells. That is basically what happens in human beings because in humans, we are nothing more than walking tissue cultures. So. Suppose we have a human being here, 
He gets infected with the AIDS virus, and what happens? Eventually, the AIDS virus wipes out his T4 lymphocytes, destroys his thymus most probably, and as a result, relieves him immune-suppressed, immune-compromised, and susceptible to the development of infections such as pneumocystis crinine pneumonia or the arisal of cancer such as Kaposi sarcoma. These have been the basic hallmarks of the AIDS virus. But again, let's look at the overall picture. And the overall picture is that suddenly in humans, we have an explosion of disease, not just AIDS, but other retroviruses, HTLV-1, T-cell leukemia virus, HTLV-2, HTLV-3, HTLV-4, which is a new, recently recognized AIDS virus, also known as HIV-2, HTLV-5, which is the cause of mycosis fungoides, and HTLV-1 look-alike, which looks like this. I call it one look-alike. Now, even looking at, say, let's throw AIDS out for a minute, you have to ask yourself, where did all these other viruses come from? And my explanation as to where these other things have come from, along with the AIDS virus, is the following. If you look at animals, particularly cattle and sheep, you'll discover the interest an interesting phenomenon. In cattle, there's a virus known as bovine leukemia virus, which has the exact same morphology, which means shape, the exact same relative molecular weight, the same magnesium dependency, and the ability to produce B and T cell leukemia of cattle and is proliferative in tissue culture. If you look at bovine sensational virus, you'll find another virus of cattle, which has the same shape, the same magnesium dependency, the same basic appearance, and produces hairy cell leukemia in cattle. If you look back, you can discover a virus known as bovine Visna virus, which has the same appearance as AIDS, the same molecular weight, the same magnesium dependency, and in 1974, either one or three here, bovine leukemia or bovine Visna virus was producing pneumocystis carini pneumonia in chimpanzees. And if that is an AIDS, I don't know what it is. So now we have HTLV4, which may represent a recombination between Visna and HTLV2, or bovine syncytial virus here, which is a new AIDS virus growing, just identified, which has this appearance. We have HTLV5, which I'm not sure in animals what it is, and we have HTLV1 lookalike. You'll recall that Dr. Strecker has shown us that the AIDS virus selects and destroys T4 cells. These are the cells in our bodies that protect us against the development of cancers. Now, persons infected with the AIDS virus have T4 cell destruction and subsequent development of specific types of cancer. These include Carposi sarcoma and pneumocystic carini pneumonia, which are fatal. Looking at the overall virus picture in a general way, Dr. Strecker has pointed out that there are several other deadly retroviruses, besides the actual AIDS virus, which are infecting humans and causing cancers, including cancer of the blood, leukemia. Dr. Strecker makes an interesting and startling correlation. These human cancer-causing retroviruses, including AIDS, all have striking similarities to animal viruses, but not from the green monkey, from cattle and sheep, known as bovine and Visna viruses. But the implications of these similarities between human and animal viruses is disturbing. How did animal viruses get into humans? As we shall see, this subject begins to reveal the true origins of the AIDS virus. Now, why do I bring up the question of cattle viruses and sheep viruses when everybody says that these viruses came from monkeys. I say that for the following reason. If you look at the genes of the AIDS virus, the genes of the AIDS virus don't look like monkeys. The genes of the AIDS virus in every paper published to date look like the following. Bovine leukemia virus of cattle or Visna virus of sheep. Now, these are retroviruses of animals and these viruses are known to cause brain rot in sheep and to cause leukemia of cattle. So, is it possible, I mean, is my question, is it possible to cross these two viruses and make AIDS? Now, of course, if you go down and ask your local AIDS expert, is that possible? Most of them, most of them 
will probably lie and tell you, no, that's not possible, that's just nonsense. But the truth of the matter is, is that AIDS viruses, in a sense, are much like humans, in that if you have bovine leukemia virus on one hand, and Visna virus on the other hand, and you simultaneously infect a human tissue culture, what comes out of that infection is not only the original parents, bovine leukemia virus and Visna virus, but what comes out of that is every possible recombinant that will grow. In fact, not only that, also comes out of the ones that won't grow, which you can't identify because some of them down here are recombinants that come out, but they won't reproduce. They're called, in fact, in, in retrovirology, those are called incompetent. They're not capable of reproduction. You might call them impotent. They can't reproduce. So we get out not only the competent, but the impotent. So, in fact, these viruses do, in a sense, not only reproduce themselves, but they make babies, which are different than the parental strain. It's just like each of us. Each of us is a recombination of our fathers and our mothers. If you say, well, we look at the AIDS virus, and we say, well, it's only 50% identical to Visna, and it's only 50% identical to bovine leukemia. And they say that's, quote, distally, quote, distally related. It's like saying I'm distally related to my mother or my father because I only contain 50% of their genes. Of course, that's nonsense. The fact is, is that containing 50% of the genes of the virus, you could be the direct descendant of the parents. It's the same as each of us. Each of us is a direct descendant of our parents, and we contain 50% of our mother's genes and 50% of our father's genes. Now, we say that this virus was predicted. Now, how can we say that? We can say that because if you review the literature as far back as 1966, a writing in Lancet, McFarland Burnett said the following. The human implications of what is going on in a sophisticated universe of tissue culture cells, bacteria, and the viruses are at best dubious, at most frankly terrifying. Later, in concluding an article addressing the bad aspects of molecular biology, the author states, This series of articles is designed, I believe, to persuade readers to think again about some current dogmas that have grown up in medicine, and not necessarily to offer alternative approaches. These dogmas could be referring to those regarding AIDS, many of which are not true. Regardless of your beliefs in the origin of man, being that of an evolutionist or creationist, the author raises an alarming point about the manipulation of mankind through genetic engineering. Medicine must make use of all the sciences, but it must also recognize the limitations that the process of evolution and the nature of man places on their utilization. It is a hard thing for an experimental scientist to accept, but it is becoming all too evident that there are dangers in knowing what we should not know. So what is he saying there? He's saying that we're fooling around with the very nature of life and that when you're doing that, you may have some problems. If you're a creationist and you believe that God created the universe, the answer would be, what makes you think that you can make it better? If you're an evolutionist and you believe that man evolved over thousands and thousands of years and all life evolved, then what makes you think that you can make it better in a few years compared to what has taken, say, hundreds of thousands of years to occur? Back to the prediction. If we address what Jay Clemenson said... Jay Clemenson from the Danish Cancer Registry in addressing an International Assembly of Leukemia experts said, We are in fact establishing conditions for a possible pandemic of an oncogenic virus varied on the scale of influenza of 1918. Now what is she saying there? She's saying that what's going to happen in the near future, and she said this in 73, is that someday you're going to be walking down the street and what drops on you isn't going to be influenza, it's going to be leukemia or cancer. She says, It is possible to visualize the mutation of a virus into a variety of high contagiosity to man, resulting in a pandemic of neoplastic disease before we could even develop a vaccine. What is she saying here? She's saying that what's going to happen, and she says it here, is because of serial passage of viruses in tissue culture and adaptation to man, that you will develop a new virus which will infect man, give him cancer before you have the, the chance to develop a vaccine against that. 
And my question is, isn't that just exactly what has happened with the AIDS pandemic? She closes by saying, uh, basically, we who are about to die salute you. And I'm not quite sure what that means, but we can each draw our own conclusions. Now, how could you adapt a virus, say, bovine Vizna virus, if you had it in hand to grow in human beings? This is actually the crux of the AIDS, AIDS issue. The NIH would have us believe, and other so-called AIDS experts, that the virus jumped species from chimpanzees in Africa to humans by biting someone on the butt, and then, bam, we got AIDS all over Africa. Now, of course, they tell us, don't they, that you can't transfer this virus by biting or by saliva, yet they would have us believe that this monkey transferred it by saliva, and the fact of the matter is, is that the AIDS virus reportedly won't grow in African green monkeys. It doesn't cause disease there. And the genes of the AIDS virus don't look like monkeys. They look like the, the disease affecting cattle and sheep. So if we had a virus named bovine visna in our laboratory, how could we adapt it accidentally or on purpose to grow in humans? Now, that was addressed in a series of very interesting experiments published by Stuart Aronson of the National Institute of Health in 1971. The first article was called Common Alterations of RNA Tumor Viruses, and what he did was he grew a mouse virus, an RNA retrovirus of mice, in human tissue. And what happened was that that mouse virus adapted to human tissue. It became human-like, in a sense, and it would now only grow in human tissue. It would no longer grow in a mouse. Now, that was expanded in 1972 or so in a paper published by Leon Domchowski and Kosho Marayama from Texas Medicine, 1973, in an article entitled Cross-Species Transmission of Mammalian, we're mammals, RNA Tumor Viruses. And what they did in this paper was to show that you could take a species such as, say, cattle or sheep, and serially passage of virus, specifically an RNA retrovirus, in tissue cultures and adapt that virus to grow in another species, like man. So if the basic question is cross-species transmission of these viruses, you say, how did cross-species transmission occur? Did it occur by some monkey biting somebody on the butt in Africa and then AIDS all over Africa? Or was it by serial adaptation of the virus to humans by growth in human tissue culture. Now, you say the virus is requested. How can we uh, say this virus is requested? Surely nobody would request the AIDS virus. Yet, when you address Bulletin of the World Health Organization, published in 1972, it says specifically the following. An attempt should be made to ascertain whether viruses can in fact exert selective effects on the immune function. By depressing 7S versus 19S antibody, or by affecting T cell as opposed to B cell function. The possibility should be looked into that the immune response to the virus may itself be impaired if the effective viruses damage more or less selectively the cells responding to the viral antigens. Now what does that say? That says, let's make a cell, let's make a virus, sorry, let's make a virus that selectively inhibits the T cell system of man. And of course, what is that virus? That virus is AIDS. So, is it a mere coincidence that we now have a pandemic of a T cell destroying virus, which was in a sense predicted and here requested growing in Africa and the United States? Now, this question was addressed partially in an article written Monday, May 11th, 1987. And in that article, in the front page of the London Times, which addressed the question of, was there an association between the WHO vaccine programs in Africa and the outbreak of AIDS? Their conclusion was the following, that there was an association. Well, the story goes like this. Supposedly, somebody had been hired by the WHO 
to investigate whether or not the WHO vaccine programs in Africa, the WHO meaning the World Health Organization, which were the WHO vaccine programs which were responsible for eradication of smallpox in Africa, may have been a contributing factor to the spread of AIDS in Africa. Evidently, a researcher who has remained anonymous, is afraid to reveal his name, was hired by the World Health Organization to investigate that study. He did a study over a year or two. He wrote a report. He submitted it to the World Health Organization, the WHO, was paid, and that was the end of it. A year or so later, he walks in to the London Times and throws the report on Pierce Wright's desk, who is the science writer at the London Times, and said, if you really want to know what's going on with AIDS in Africa, here's the answer. That article was the impetus for the printing of this story, which said there's a correspondence between the WHO's program in Africa and the outbreak of AIDS. As far as we know, this has never been discussed or addressed in this country. And I find that particularly interesting as to why it's never been addressed in the United States for the following reason. A quote in that, in that article on Monday, May 11th, was from Dr. Robert Gallo, who is the reported co-discoverer of the AIDS virus, who said that this was an interesting and important hypothesis. An interesting and important hypothesis. Well, if it's interesting and important, how come nobody's addressing it? Obviously, uh, in a sense, the answer to that might be, if you made AIDS, would you tell anybody? Of course not. Did you read about this World Health Organization's vaccine program and the development of AIDS in your local newspaper? Not likely. The American press virtually ignored this front-page story in the prestigious London Times, one of Europe's most respected newspapers. The story caused a furor. Front-page stories appeared throughout Europe, Latin America, and other parts of the free world. While here in the United States, the story was relegated to obscurity. Why? Why is the American press failing to investigate this controversial story? Why are the American people being denied critical information, which is widely distributed through most of the rest of the world. Dr. Strecker has looked deeper into this mystery surrounding the WHO vaccine program in Africa, and now he's going to tell you how this AIDS infection could have occurred, because now you're going to get the facts. Now, how could this, how could this virus have been, say, inoculated by the WHO in Africa? There are two ways. Obviously, if it was intentional, that is the first way. Intentional, and people say, well, that's absurd. Uh, and I said, no, that's not absurd because of the following reason. Beginning in the early 30s or 40s in this country, in Tuskegee, Alabama, uh, there was a study undertaken by the United States Public Health Service which enlisted black men who were infected with syphilis, omega, uh, syphilis, omega syphilis. And those black men were serially followed over many years. The important part of that study was that they were also followed after penicillin became available and most of them were specifically prevented from being treated with penicillin, which led to the infection of their wives and the development of congenitally infected syphilitic black children uh, in, a, in the Tuskegee, Alabama experiment. Now that is documented in a book by James Jones, James Jones entitled Bad Blood. For anybody who'd like to review the intentional infliction of disease upon American citizens, you can address yourself to this book, Bad Blood by James Jones. Furthermore, between 1959 and approximately 1970, there were over 300 biological experiments conducted on United States citizens, unknowns to them, such as documented in a book called A Higher Form of Killing by Paxman and Harris, which documents all the biological uh, warfare uh, history of the United States that's known more or less in book form. But to say that, the, that this government or other governments are not capable of doing these kinds of experiments is to not face reality. So obviously if it was intentionally induced, then there could be an, a reason to see the explosion of AIDS in Africa. But more, more, there could be an accidental introduction. And how could that have occurred? could have occurred in the following manner. If you look at cattle, how was the AIDS virus produced? I mean, how was the smallpox vaccine produced? Smallpox vaccine was produced, according to the report by the WHO, the World Health Organization, in approximately 46 countries, directly from cattle. 
The belly of a cow would be shaved. It would be sliced open. Smallpox vaccine would be dripped on. He would be placed in stanchions so that he couldn't lick his belly. A week or so later, they'd come by, place a stainless steel container underneath it, shave off the scabs, collect the scabs and effluent into the stainless steel container, dry it out, and that's your next smallpox vaccine. Now, obviously, any virus contaminating the cow, such as bovine Vizna virus, bovine leukemia virus, bovine syncytial virus, could be a potential contaminant of that smallpox preparation. In 1981, Cedric Mims, writing in Microbiological Reviews, stated that a alleged bovine Visna virus was a known contaminant of fetal calf serum. Now, what does that mean? That means that in 1981, at the same time that the AIDS virus was discovered, that they identified a virus named bovine Visna, which was contaminating fetal calf serum of cows. That means that this virus was present not only in cows, but was present in the growth media that was being used on tissue cultures worldwide. It means that fetal calf serum, which is like the growth hormone for human and other animal tissue cultures, was contaminated with a virus which we know may have some, if not a direct, identicality to AIDS. Now, if we look and say what's going to happen in the next few years with these retrovirus infections, it brings to mind several important points. The first off, when we talk about retroviral diseases, if you really want to know about retroviruses, the people that you have to talk to are the veterinarians. Most medical doctors have had little, if any, experience with these type of diseases, whereas the veterinarians are the ones who have had the most experience. It's not by error that Dr. Myron Essex, uh, who's in charge of the Human Leukemia Resource Group at Harvard, is a veterinarian. It's not by error that O.W. Jarrett, who was recently funded with $8 million United States dollars for the establishment of an IR leukemia research group in Glasgow, is a veterinarian. These people are in charge because they have a great deal of knowledge about retroviral infections. And when you look at retroviral infections, when you see an index case, like a case of AIDS, in general, the rule of thumb is that there are 99 cases subclinical or below it supporting this one case on top. In the case of the United States with 50,000 cases of AIDS, that would mean that we have approximately 5 million cases coming. Um, what else can you know from sort of the general rules of retrovirology? One of the things is that you know that the virus the viruses which support this uh, index case on the top here, one, say, ratio of 1 to 100, work over an extended period of time on the rule of thumb average 20% of the lifespan of the species. Now, this was one of the first things that led me to question the validity of much that was being told to the United States about the AIDS virus and other retroviruses was that they were predicting uh, that the AIDS virus was going to work over one to three or even five years. But actually, the rule of thumb would say that the AIDS virus should work over 20% of 70 years, which would be about 14 years. So as now more and more data comes in, we can see that this initial one to three to five years was actually more like seven to 14 years, which is consistent with what I believe is the truth about how long it will take before you see the end result of an AIDS virus infection. That has implications for many things. It, it has implications for vaccine development. In other words, you would have to wait an extended period of time before you could say for sure, 14 to 20 years before you could say for sure whether the vaccine was working. It would say you're going to have to wait 14 to 20 years or even longer before you can say, well, I've been cured of AIDS. Because if the natural history of the disease is to last over an extended period of time, say 14 to 20 years, you're going to have to wait that long before you can say you're outside of the framework of where the disease is still liable to kill you. These are slow viral diseases of humans and represent a, a major a new kind of problem that most medical doctors have had little experience in dealing with. Now, if you look at slow viral diseases, if you have an index case, that case can double to two cases, 
Those two can go to four. Those four can go to eight. In other words, there is some period of time here in which the disease doubles. Two to the X is equal to the number infected Y. Recently in the Los Angeles Times, it was noted that last year there were approximately 40,000 cases of the AIDS virus documented worldwide, by, published by the World Health Organization. This year, the number is approximately 80,000 cases of AIDS reported. We can use as a, as a uh, common denominator here one year uh, for a doubling time, which would mean that virtually in a year's time, the number of cases of AIDS, both those infected and perhaps those infected, uh, would double. What does that mean? Going back to our little uh, diagram that I explained earlier, if we had one case of AIDS uh, last year and 99 cases coming, next year we might have uh, two cases of AIDS and uh, 198 coming. The following year, there will be four cases and uh, twice as many, approximately, let's see, uh, 396 coming. So the pyramid would get progressively bigger, doubling each year. And when you look at the numbers infected in Africa, as reported by the World Health Organization, as a continent, um, Africa, through the AIDS belt and other areas of Africa, has between 40 and 75 million infected. If that doubles every year, it means that within three to four years, the entire continent of Africa may well be infected. And in the five to 10 years, the entire continent of Africa could be expected to expire if, in fact, the AIDS virus has 100% mortality, which we believe that it does. In the United States, with 50,000 cases of AIDS reported, that could imply that there are approximately 5 million infected, not the 1.5 million reported by the Centers for Disease Control, uh, approximately 5 million infected, which constitutes somewhere between one and 2% of the entire United States population. If you have 2% of the entire United States population affected already, that could double in every year, which would mean that in a one, two, three, four, five, six doubling times, six doubling times, the entire country could be infected. If it takes an average of five years before infection leads to disease, it means that Nearly everybody in the country could be infected before anybody got sick and showed evidence of infection if the virus continues to double every year. Those are pretty frightening statistics. And that applies for the AIDS virus alone without implicating any of the other viruses, HTLV1, 2, 4, 5, and 1 lookalike, which are all, of course, out there and running too. These have already been suggested that the blood supply should be screened for these viruses. We may be transfusing leukemia at the present time, just as we're transfusing AIDS uh, at the present time. Now, what about the so-called, what I call, myths of AIDS? The virus coming out of a monkey is impractical or impossible for the following reasons. If you look at Africa, if the virus came from monkeys, you would expect the virus to have spread from the jungles to the cities. Of course, that isn't what's happening or what's happened. It's spreading from the cities into the jungles. If you look at Africa, those most closely associated with, with the African green monkeys, the reputed animal of origin, pygmies, uh, should have been infected with the AIDS virus and up until the last six months or a year or so. Pygmies were virtually 100% free of AIDS virus infection. Uh, and they only got infected after uh, intercourse or contamination from prostitutes of the cities or by drug contamination from intravenous drug abuse from the cities. Stronger evidence against the virus actually coming from monkeys is the codon choices of the AIDS virus. And that means that the genetic information of the AIDS virus, known as codon choices, are not found in monkeys. They're not in monkeys. They're not in man. They actually exist in Vizna virus and a few other viruses of the laboratory. That's where the genetic structure, the genetic material, the so-called information of the genes of the AIDS virus look like Visna, as we already know, and bovine leukemia virus. So all of these mitigate against the virus coming 
from monkeys and spreading in Africa. There's another way to get at this problem. If you say, for instance, that there are between 40 and 75 million Africans infected, uh, and we know that 2 to the x is equal to 40 million, then we had to have approximately 2 to the 20th or 20-year 20 doubling time for the virus to have spread in Africa. It's now 1988. That would have meant that the virus had to originate in Africa in 1968. And, of course, by the mid-1970s uh, or early 1970s, there would have been uh, people dying of AIDS in Africa. Of course, that's not the case. The retrospective analysis of blood shows that AIDS didn't exist in Africa until the mid-70s or later. If you look at the United States, where the AIDS virus appeared, was in New York in 1978, San Francisco and Los Angeles in 80. It appeared in young white male homosexuals who were between the ages of 20 and 40, who were promiscuous. It did not appear in black, heterosexual, French-speaking uh, immigrants from Africa or Haiti. Now, simultaneous with its appearance was conduction of the hepatitis B vaccine study in New York in 1978 and in San Francisco and Los Angeles in 1980 among young white male homosexuals who were between the ages of 20 and 40. Later published in the 80s in Morbidity Mortality Weekly was that six of the first 10 AIDS cases in San Francisco came directly out of the cohort study of 1980. Published in 1986 by Clad Stevens was a graph which showed that in 1984, approximately 45% of those in her original study were HIV positive. In other words, had become infected for AIDS in 1984. So you must ask yourself, is there some kind of relationship between the hepatitis B vaccine study of the United States and a subsequent outbreak in AIDS in exactly the same population groups in exactly the same time. I personally believe that there is, but I can't answer exactly what that relationship is. Now, is AIDS a sexually transmitted disease? It said sex and drugs. Uh, we're told that over and over. Sex and drugs, sex and drugs. Well, let's look at what a sexually transmitted disease is. I say that AIDS is a blood-borne infectious disease. I don't think of AIDS as a sexually transmitted disease, but you must define what you mean by a sexually transmitted disease. If you mean any virus that can be transferred during intercourse, then I guess AIDS would be. But of course, that would include uh, polio, mono, smallpox, chickenpox, measles, mumps, practically every virus known to man, because every virus, sexual intercourse is intimate contact, and nearly all of those could be transferred by sexual intercourse. But if you look at what sexually transmitted diseases is, I say the following, if you go in and you say, well, doctor, I'm going to have a blood transfusion, do you think I'm going to get trichomonas from that blood transfusion? And then you'd say, no, you don't get trichomonas. Well, isn't that a sexually transmitted disease like AIDS? You say, yeah, yeah, it is, but it's not in the blood. Well, you think I'll get herpes from a blood transfusion? No. How about, have it, uh, uh, how about syphilis? Well, it's possible you could get syphilis from a blood transfusion because syphilis has a blood-borne phase. Now, if you look at what sexually transmissible diseases are, they grow in the venereal tract. They're present in high titers. They don't live outside the body for a long period of time. A uh, long life here. And they're primarily transferred by sex. Now, which of these criteria does AIDS meet? Does AIDS grow in the venereal tract, specifically, like trichomonas, gonorrhea, syphilis, herpes, no, that's wrong. It grows throughout the body in the lymphocytic system and destroys the thymus. Is it present in high titers? There is no AIDS virus ever been identified in semen. It has only been cultured from semen. The only place that AIDS virus was identified by sedimentation by ultracentrifugation was in saliva, uh, not from semen. Now, that isn't to say that AIDS can't be cultured from cells of semen. It says that AIDS does not exist as a free virus in semen. So it's not present in high titers. So we're wrong on two, two of four so far. Does AIDS live outside the body for a long period of time? You know, a few minutes. We've been told that, but the French published two years ago that if you put AIDS in a petri dish and place it on a windowsill in France, that it lives there for approximately 10 to 14 days. You come back, add saline, you can culture the virus. 
So AIDS lives for 10 to 14 days outside the body. So it doesn't meet criteria number three for what I call a sexually transmissible disease. And is AIDS primarily transferred by sex? Uh, well, they like for us to believe that, but I don't believe there's any evidence that this virus is primarily transferred by sex. I believe the virus is a blood-borne infectious agent. How the virus is actually being transferred, I don't know. Well, the AIDS virus, according to Dr. Strecker, does not fit any of the criteria for a sexually transmitted disease. However, this doesn't mean you can't get the disease during sex. You can. For example, the common cold is not a sexually transmitted or venereal disease either. But could you get it during sexual intercourse? Yes, you could. But it really has nothing to do with sexual intercourse itself. It's the intimate contact, or close contact, that spreads the AIDS virus, according to Dr. Strecker. You see, no one really knows how the virus is transmitted. Not even the so-called AIDS experts. Because the virus was apparently introduced in homosexuals in this country, it was homosexuals who passed it during intimate contact. Thus, it became a homosexual disease. Again, a misleading and distorted conclusion. In light of these revelations by Dr. Strecker, what about the use of condoms? Well, condoms are effective in preventing certain venereal diseases. But because AIDS is not a venereal disease, the condom's effectiveness in preventing AIDS transmission remains questionable. In addition, the AIDS virus is so small it can pass through the naturally occurring holes in condoms. Well, using a condom may be better than nothing, but the degree of protection from AIDS transmission has not been fully researched. Dr. Strecker will explain this further in his presentation. If we look at Confronting AIDS, which is the textbook uh, published by the Institute of Medicine and the National Academy of Sciences, it is not known whether the virus is transferred as free virus or a cell-associated virus or in both forms. Now, what is that saying? That's saying the following, that when it comes to how the virus, the AIDS virus, is being transferred from one person to another, like from one homosexual to another, or from a heterosexual man to a heterosexual woman, this is a man, this is a woman, they can't tell us whether the virus is being transferred as free viral particle or as viral particle inside of a cell. Now, I use the illustration, that's like General Patton saying that he can't tell the difference between a tank that's assembled and one that's in a factory. There's a tremendous difference. So, when you get down to actually how this virus is being transferred, there is very little, if any, data published that tells us how it's being transferred from one person to another. They like to tell us that it's just a sexually transmissible disease, but they don't tell us anything about how the virus is getting across the membranes of either the man or the woman. And of course, depending on how it's getting across, has a great deal to do with how really dangerous it is for the long run. So I call that the myth of sexually transmissible diseases. Now condoms. Now this is a, this is another great topic. Um, in a recent Los Angeles Times article was entitled uh, an article entitled "Coop Warns on Risk of AIDS in Condom Use." According to Surgeon General C. Everett Coop, long a highly visible advocate of condom use to prevent the spread of AIDS warn that prophylactics have extraordinarily high failure rates among homosexuals and offer them no assurance of safe sex. Later, Coop states, quote, I don't like to acknowledge mistakes, and I don't want to use the word mistake in reference to that report, unquote. Further, Coop said that since the initial report was written, he has been surprised to find a near-complete lack of research on condom failure rates and causes. Only one study in progress has ever been designed to explore the various issues of condom breakage and leakage rates as they relate to AIDS. Now, I use the following illustration to represent this is a condom. This is a natural occurring hole in the condom, which is approximately 1.5 microns in diameter, which is 1 to 10 times larger than the size of the AIDS virus. This will represent, a, a for the moment, a penis, and this represents the subsequent ejaculation that's occurring from that condom on that penis. Now, what about the question of mosquito transmission of this virus? 
AIDS virus is a known close relative to two other animal retroviruses named equine infectious anemia virus and caprine arthritis encephalitis virus. This one affects horses. This one affects uh, goats. That's not to say that the AIDS virus didn't come from, say, BLV and sheep, but what we're talking about is that this end product, the AIDS virus, is also a great deal like these viruses. Now, equine infectious anemia virus, which in the south was known as swamp fever, is an, a swamp fever is a known vector-borne virus and has been known to be vector-borne since about 1920 or so. That means it's borne by blood-sucking insects. It's transferred by blood-sucking insects. Caprine arthritis encephalitis virus, the father of the AIDS virus, bovine leukemia virus, Visna virus, the sheep uh, brain rot virus, what I call the mother of AIDS virus, um, bovine syncytial virus, all of the near relatives of the AIDS viruses, most of them are, or at least indications are, that they are vector-borne or potentially transferred from animal to animal by blood-sucking insects. So the burden of proof is on those who say that the AIDS virus is not mosquito-transmitted. If you actually believe that the AIDS virus is not transferred by mosquitoes, then um, you have to say, if that's really true, then why don't we use the technique that the mosquito uses for transfusing blood? Because if a mosquito somehow arbitrarily filters out the AIDS virus, then why don't we filter blood through that same kind of mechanism and no one would get an AIDS virus from a blood transfusion? The burden of proof is on those who say the virus is not transferred by mosquitoes rather than on those who say uh, that it is. The experiment I'd like to see run, which no one has volunteered for of all these so-called AIDS experts that tell us the virus isn't transferred by mosquitoes, is to let a box full of mosquitoes feed on AIDS infected blood, bite the researchers on the wrist, and let's see how many of them get AIDS. Of course, they haven't published that experiment yet, have they? Now, what about vaccine development? Will there be a vaccine? I personally think that the development of a vaccine for the AIDS virus is, if not impossible, next to it. I say that for two reasons. The first is that I believe that the AIDS virus rose by recombination or mixing of bovine leukemia virus and Visna virus. The actual fact is, is that the genes of the AIDS virus contain approximately 9,000 base pairs. Each base pair has four choices, which means there are 9,000 times 9,000 times 9,000 times 9,000 different AIDS viruses. That means that instead of being a single virus, there's a field effect, what I call a field effect of viruses. There's a whole menagerie of viruses. And that, of course, explains why every AIDS virus that has been isolated to date is different. That's, of course, except for Dr. Gallows and Dr. Montagnier's, which I guess have been proven to be the same, but that's a different story. But for the moment, let's look at the fact that the AIDS viruses were all different. They talk about AIDS as if it was a stable virus, like smallpox, which is the same today as it was 100 years ago, more or less, or chickenpox, or measles, or mumps. But the actual fact is, is that every AIDS virus isolated from every patient, more or less, has been different. The reason is, is because the virus is chameleon-like, as we already talked about. It interacts with the tissue that it's growing in. And if it's growing in you, it interacts with you, and it comes out different than what went in. In a sense, if it goes in as AIDS-1, what comes out is not necessarily AIDS-1, but maybe AIDS-2, which is a little bit different. It looks a little like you. It's chameleon-like. That explains why, besides the fact that it's the basic nature of these viruses to recombine, it's the, it's the fact that, that every AIDS virus isolated to date is different. Here, just to, just to sideline here a little bit, let's look at uh, this question of vaccine and the natural uh, recombinant nature, which is why the first point that there won't be a, a vaccine, 9,000 to the fourth power. If you look at AIDS, the disease, the virus itself, without addressing the recombinant nature, the viruses, retroviruses, as a rule of thumb, are known to spontaneously mutate about 1% a year. This means that if 
today the virus is this, that one year from now the virus would be different at approximately 1% of 9,000, which would be 90 points. Now, interestingly enough, one of the, the theories of the so-called AIDS experts, if you believe this, it must, one must conclude, at least I would say, that one must conclude that the world is flat. Now, why do I say that? We say that because the so-called AIDS experts tell us that the Portuguese took this virus to Japan, out of Africa, and spread it there in the 1500s or so. Uh, now, how can you conclude then that the world is flat? I say that for the following reasons. If we look at Portugal, nobody in Portugal has AIDS or reported to have AIDS or any of the other so-called human retroviruses, which means that none of those sailors ever got back home, so they must have fallen off at the end of the world. Two, if you look at this virus, you say today, if this is a map of the world, and we look at the viruses isolated from Haiti, Africa, and Japan, and these viruses were put into those countries in the 1500s by Portugal sailors, and they spontaneously mutate 1% a year. It's presently 1988, which means that there should be 488% difference but the actual fact is that in the case of HTLV-1 isolates from Japan, Africa, and Haiti, those isolates are virtually identical, which means that they could only have been put into those areas in recent times, if my mathematics is correct. Now, two, the real reason that I feel that there will not be a vaccine developed for AIDS is the following. One is the recombinant nature. Two, AIDS, HIV, and other retroviruses address the central issue of processing. In other words, if you go back to the original article written in 1972 by the, in, in the bulletin of the World Health Organization, there it said, let's see if we can make a virus that selectively destroys the cell that's responsible for processing the virus. Of course, that's what AIDS is. In a sense, that's what macrophages are. It is the macrophage's job to process this virus and present it to the T lymphocyte for development of immunity. But what happens is, is that the macrophage can't kill the virus. It grows inside the macrophage. The macrophage may actually be injecting it into other cells throughout the body, which leads to death of T4 lymphocytes and perhaps other cells, such as brain cells. The central defect in AIDS, in my opinion, lies not necessarily in the lymphocytic system, the lymphocytes, but in the macrophage system, the cell that's responsible for processing the virus. You can think of it sort of like a macrophage is like a rendering plant or a meat packing plant, which brings in the whole cow, chops it up, and sends it out packaged. The macrophage's job is to process the virus and send it out in a, in a form that the body can use to develop immunity. Now. What happens if you get infected with the AIDS virus and you have an antibody directed against that virus? This is the antibody, and this is the virus. Here's the virus. Now, those uh, form a conjugate if you have a vaccination against AIDS. What then is the, that is the actual purpose of a vaccine, to produce these antibodies directed against the AIDS virus. If you're vaccinated against AIDS, you have these conjugates formed. That enables the macrophage to ingest those antibody antigens more easily. So this whole complex is then ingested inside of the macrophage. This is the macrophage. The macrophage then chews up the antibody. The virus grows inside the cell, and you die quicker than if you had not been vaccinated. This is, in my opinion, the central reason why vaccinations against AIDS may not only be detrimental, but prove to be ultimately impossible. Dr. Strecker has presented two clear and rational reasons why an AIDS vaccine can never be developed. First, the astronomical number of mutations of the virus means a specific vaccine for a specific virus cannot be made. And second, the way in which the virus is processed in the human body would make an AIDS infection even more rapidly fatal when treated with a vaccine. This is tragically disappointing to the many proponents of a vaccine cure, 
But it is equally tragic to blindly pursue a vaccine cure that cannot work, thereby delaying research of alternative methods, which may hold the answer to this devastating plague. Now, is the AIDS virus uh, something that's going to die out uh, naturally? There's been recent reports that heterosexuals needn't worry. The virus is not, it's just a sexually transmitted disease and it's not very transmissible and that there's no evidence that it's spreading into the heterosexual population, although the numbers in Africa are 75 million or more heterosexuals infected, according to the WHO. The number of worldwide AIDS cases appears to be doubling every year, according to the WHO, the World Health Organization, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if you address the question of eradicability of a virus, in other words, what makes a virus eradicable? Is it possible to get this virus out of humans once it's running there? In 1977, Frank Fenner wrote an article about the eradication of smallpox. It's published in the Progress in Medical Virology. Frank Fenner, uh, who was at the time at the Center for Resource Environmental Studies, the Australian National Universi University in Canberra. He's a world-renowned virologist, and he wrote the following. He said, under prerequisites for eradicability, in other words, what is required to get the disease out of humans? Quote, one can virtually rule out the possibility of worldwide eradication of an infectious disease if any, any of the following criteria are obtained. One, the agent grows in wild animals or birds. So it has an animal reservoir. Now, if you believe that AIDS came from monkeys, which I don't, or if you believe it came from sheep or cattle, which I do, either one, there's an obvious animal reservoir. So that would preclude eradicability. Two, the agent persists in the affected human being for years in their recrudescences. So the AIDS virus existing over 14 years or longer and having a slow viral progression obviously makes number two a second factor for non eradicability. Three, the disease has multiple serological types. In other words, there are many variants to the AIDS virus. We've already discussed that and shown there are approximately 9,000 of the fourth different AIDS virus possible, which makes third criteria for eradicability voided. And four, the necessary degree of social cooperation cannot be obtained, quote, as with the human venereal diseases. In other words, if the disease is a sexually transmissible disease or venereal disease, then you cannot eradicate it from humans once it's running because you cannot obtain the degree of social cooperation necessary for eradication. So, not only does AIDS violate one of these four criteria, it violates all four. So once we have AIDS running in humans, it appears to be that it's going to be here for a very long period of time, along with all of its relatives, HTLV1, 2, 4, 5, and 1 lookalike. So we have a tremendous problem facing us, not just a problem of the AIDS virus alone. Now, what kinds of uh, treatment? Is there any hope at all? Uh, this pre paints a pretty grim picture, but it's my personal feeling that uh, there, is some, there is some hope presently, but there is actually maybe uh, a cure for these diseases, and, uh, and I'll explain that in a minute. But what's available at the present time? At the present time, there's a drug known as azithromycin, which is actually like junk food for viruses. Uh, what it does is that the virus preferentially uses this for making itself, leads to uh, a defect in virus production. Azithromycin is like junk food for viruses, and the virus dies out in the body. But the problem is, is this drug also makes the body die out, so it's like junk food for humans in a sense. That is not very satisfactory. There are many other products that are being worked on. Uh, some people think that there will be a vaccine development, and of course, we all hope that's true, but as explained previously, I think that's impossible for two reasons. Uh, there are alternative doctors, uh, alternative doctors uh, who believe that such things as high-dose uh, vitamin C, uh, zinc, uh, selenium, and other chemicals besides or in addition to AZT are useful in prolonging life. Uh, but the uh, bottom line of that is my own personal experience has been I have yet to see a single person who was documented with AIDS, the disease, who has been cured, convincingly cured. I don't believe that I have seen a single person yet who actually meets those criteria, although we hear a lot about it. 
But there is, I think, a, a technique that may exist and has been broached by Baylor recently, uh, which holds the cure for not only this disease, but perhaps many other virus diseases. The principle of this cure is very simple. The principle is just like if you have a crystal glass and you irradiate it with a proper audio tone, if you're holding that glass and you sing the proper note, the glass shatters, but your hand doesn't fall apart. This demonstration shows how high-frequency radio waves can shatter crystals, and viruses are crystalline structures. Now, in 1925 to 1945 or so, uh, what I feel was perhaps the greatest inventor of all times, Raymond Roy Rife, or Royal Rife, uh, said uh, that he could, in, could take viruses, which are little crystals, irradiate them with a proper radio wave and cause their disruption without disrupting human tissue. Most doctors say, well, that's, of course, nonsense. And you say, well, doctor, do you don't think that we can destroy uh, viruses with uh, light or shake them to death? And they say no. And then you say, well, doctor, what kind of uh, techniques do you use in your laboratory to kill viruses when they're blown out your uh, hoods where you're experimenting? And what they use is ultraviolet light and what's UV light. That is nothing more than electromagnetic radiation of the proper wavelength. So it's a proven fact beyond anybody's uh, misrepresentation that electromagnetic radiation of the proper form can kill viruses. Now recently published in, in uh, some medical journals and published in several newspapers was a report out of Baylor University which had done the following. They had taken blood which was contaminated with herpes virus, with uh, cytomegalovirus, and with AIDS virus. And they had irradiated the blood with uh, laser light and shown that they could kill the virus without killing the cells. So the cells were still viable, but the viruses had been destroyed. And of course, that broaches the very topic of electromagnetic cure of viral diseases. And it's my feeling that this is where the actual cure for the AIDS virus will come. It's theoretically possible that someday we may actually have a machine which could identify, based upon the readings determined, what kind of virus you were infected with, and then treat the human being with a radio wave, which would destroy the virus contained not only in his blood, but in his entire body. If that, in fact, proves to be the case, I think that is the way that AIDS and other so-called human retroviruses, which in my opinion are nothing more than animal retroviruses now running in humans, can be not only cured, but eradicated from the world throughout. Now, why was Rife able to do these sort of magical things that he says that he could do? Um, he, he may have been able to actually see the viruses. Rife was a master uh, m machinist, and he says that he invented a microscope uh, with which he could actually view viruses in the living state. He says that the microscope had a magnification of 70 to 100,000 times in living tissue. Now, I don't know if Rife actually invented this uh, machine to, and could view viruses in the living tissue, but I know that these machines actually exist. None of them are presently in working order, but if they in fact existed and if in fact what Rife said is correct, that he could view viruses in the living state, of course, he may have been able then to determine what he called the mortal oscillatory rate, uh, which was the frequency at which he would irradiate the virus or other bacteria to kill it. He called it the MOR, mortal oscillatory rate. And uh, he says that in doing them, he would uh, irradiate these viruses with basically monochromatic light, which we today would think of as laser light. The virus would light up in a sense. It would absorb energy and emit energy. He could see them and then by increasing the amplitude of the energy into the virus that he could cause the virus to disrupt. In a sense, you can think about it just like the example given before of the crystal destroyed by the audio tone, or you can think of it like your house being shaken down during an earthquake. Now, in summary then, what have we got here? I have given you today the fact that the virus, I think, the AIDS virus pandemic was not only uh, present present today, but predicted as far back as 1966 by McFarland Burnett and by Clemenson, who said, you better get ready for walking down the street and getting hit 
with a virus that causes leukemia or something else, just as we have. The fact that the virus may have been produced by crossing bovine leukemia virus and Vizna virus to produce bovine Vizna virus and adapted to grow in humans by growth in human tissue. The fact that the WHO in 1972 wrote an article that said, let's make a T-cell destroying virus. So they crossed the T-trophic virus with the great destroyer of Vizna to make a T-cell destroyer. And then is it just coincidence that the AIDS pandemic in Africa occurs at the same vaccination centers where the smallpox was conducting, where the WHO was conducting its smallpox eradication programs? Uh, what are the myths of AIDS? AIDS is a homosexual disease. is obviously a myth that it's uh, uh, going to have a very short incubation period, that it came from African green monkeys, that it's going to die out in heterosexuals, that it's no problem, et cetera, et cetera. All these things uh, I call the myth information of AIDS, and I covered all that. And then the final is, is what can we expect to cure this virus, not only uh, in the near future, uh, but perhaps for all time? And I think that the cure for AIDS will lie in the reconstruction or redevelopment of electromagnetic or electrophysiologic techniques which will allow for identification and perhaps for then obliteration of viruses either in blood extracorporeally circulated and treated extracorporeally or actually irradiated as man with a radio wave or carrier wave passing through them and destroying the virus inside the human being. Dr. Strecker, I have watched and listened to your presentation, frankly, in awe, and it occurs to me that if only a small portion of what you've been saying is true, that we as Americans have been, frankly, led down the primrose path by those in power who have been giving us information regarding the AIDS epidemic. What you've actually said is that the AIDS epidemic not only did not come from the green African monkey, as we've been told, but in fact was uh, the epidemic itself was started in the 70s in Africa uh, and coincided almost directly with a smallpox uh, vaccination program that's sponsored by the World Health Organization. Uh, and if that's true, the implications of that, of course, are, are astounding. You're also asserting that this disease is not a venereal disease, may or may not be transmitted sexually, possibly can be transmitted uh, outside the body by, by carriers such as mosquitoes. Uh, the virus itself doesn't correspond to anything we know about venereal diseases. The French have isolated this virus and it can live outside the body, another thing I'm told couldn't be possible. Uh, we're hearing so much about condoms today as being a good preventative of this disease, and you've literally shot holes in that theory. Uh, all these things are astounding. Why in the world would our government, the World Health Organization, the National Institute of Health, lead us down this garden path? What's behind all of this? Um, well, I, I think the answer, the uh, simple answer to that is, of course, first off, if you knew that you'd constructed the virus or had somehow been responsible for its construction or spread, would you tell anybody? I think it's clear that no, you wouldn't want anybody to know that you had anything to do with it. And of course, uh, then the people who are responsible are not going to want anybody to know that they were responsible. So it's, uh, I think it would be naive to suspect that someone would come out and say, hey, I, I made AIDS and spread it. I mean, that's it's Yet you read us documents where it was the disease was uh, predicted that we're sooner or later going to run into an epidemic, l epidemic like this, and then you read uh, a document where it was uh, where it was proposed. Why don't we try and do something like this? And then we have the smallpox inoculation program, and correspondingly, in those very same five areas, the smallpox, uh, the AIDS epidemic breaks out. That's correct. And right. then in America, where everybody is lambasting homosexuals as this being a homosexual disease, you've told us that there was a hepatitis B vaccine uh, uh, program. Again, the epidemiology of the AIDS outbreak in the United States, in my opinion, exactly corresponds to the hepatitis B vaccine program. It corresponds not only in the exact age group, the uh, homosexuals in the same cities, in the same time frame. 
1978 in New York and then 1980 basically in Los Angeles and San Francisco. So how can our government be telling us that this is a homosexual disease when the disease apparently broke out as a result of this inoculation for a hepatitis B program? Because, uh, because in fact, that's what it looked like from the beginning. So, I mean, that is the easy assumption that it is a homosexual disease because it's growing and running and spreading in homosexuals. But that, that has uh, absolutely no logical uh, validity in concluding that the homosexuals were responsible for the disease. Okay, I have about 20 more questions, <laughs> but there are other people here. Go ahead. Well, after, after watching your presentation, is there any hope for us? Well, you're yes. talking about how it doubling right, right. and doubling. Uh, actually, you're right. We're talking about uh, how the virus spreads, what the projections are. If Frank Fenner was correct in the article that he said, what makes a virus eradicable, the AIDS and other human retroviruses probably violate most, if not all, the criteria that makes these diseases eradicable. eradicable. In other words, they can never be eliminated from humans once they're running in humans, as short of the redevelopment or uh, new construction of the rife techniques which might allow for wide-scale uh, treatment of uh, entire areas simultaneously if in fact what rife said was correct and that was that you could treat a human being uh, by a radio wave that would kill a virus in that human if it requires personal uh, dialysis like equipment which would be to hook the human up take the blood out, radiate it in extracorporeally like they dialyze blood to cure kidney failure, then that is going to be a very costly, slow process. It could be effective, but it's not the way that we're going to save Africa. If that is, in fact, the way that AIDS or those other viral diseases prove to be cured, then I think that, there, that, that there's no doubt that Africa is extinct as a continent, and perhaps Asia is well down the same road since they have large portions of their population are already infected with HTLV-1, human T-cell leukemia virus. A uh, practical matter, if I have a child who's in elementary school and uh, in that school there is a, uh, another child infected with AIDS, according to uh, the information you've presented, it would behoove me to make sure my child has no contact with the sick child. Would you agree? That's a very difficult question to answer. I think that if you uh, say that casual contact merely means uh, simply uh, greeting someone or very superficial uh, contact with a the person, then the risk of contracting AIDS from that kind of contact are very low. But if casual contact means uh, where a person might be bitten by an AIDS-infected person and breach of skin and perhaps a contact of blood with uh, saliva that could be infectious, then uh, that might be a problem. Uh, if we talk about uh, a person's ability to contract the disease, uh, we're talking again about this dose dependency factor. Could you explain that a little bit? Right, again, the, the, the question, well, uh, it goes back to how is the virus actually getting from one person to another person? And still, I don't find any literature or data that actually tells us how a person one, male or female, has infected another person two, male or female. In other words, whether it's homosexual to homosexual, homosexual to uh, bisexual, or homosexual to, uh, to uh, heterosexual, or heterosexual to heterosexual, there's really no data that says how the virus is getting from the first person into the second person, short of direct transfusion of blood or blood product. So now, the question is, how many viruses have to be present before the person is infectious. How are they being transduced across from one person to another? And, and at what phase during the, the first person, if he has AIDS, say if I had AIDS, at what course or what phase during my AIDS life am I really infectious? Is it, is it more infectious in the beginning or during the middle of the course or at the end of the course? Those questions, uh, so far as I can tell, have never been answered. All right, so uh, if I were to take a, a t an AIDS test, and test positive with HIV, mm -hmm. what would you say? Did I have a good chance of contracting AIDS? I'd say that, Forget it or, or, I'd say or, that you have a not. very good chance of dying prematurely due to that infection. And I think that chance is 100%. I think that 100% of those who get infected with the putative AIDS virus, HIV, human T cell lymphotrophy virus 3, will die prematurely. Uh, uh, before they would have they not been infected. From an immune system breakdown? Not necessarily. There are other diseases that could kill you without ever developing AIDS. For instance, 
A great number of AIDS patients develop AIDS dementia, which is an impairment of mental function. Uh, it's motor impairment, cognitive impairment, and, um, and um, uh, neurological impairment due to the virus acting on the brain. You can die of that virus acting on your brain before you actually ever develop any of the criteria that might say, well, this is AIDS. Is that the brain rot you were talking about? Yeah, in a sense, that's the brain rot, right? Like Visna, the mother of what I call the AIDS virus. So um, now that the definition has been expanded, only recently, well, those, some of those patients with AIDS dementia may well be included. So in AIDS, the definition. But there are other diseases that, like that uh, that could kill you before you actually ever developed AIDS or disease. You see, there's a big difference, in, at least in definition and practical terms, between having AIDS infection and having AIDS the disease. Many people so far have AIDS infection, but only 50,000 or so have developed AIDS the disease, and half of those are dead. Uh, I think that 100% of those who develop AIDS infection will die prematurely. In, in essence, you're saying that those uh, many hundreds of not only physicians but scientific researchers who have uh, been entrusted with looking into this matter are, uh, in a sense, uh, totally lacking in integrity. Or is that my interpretation of what you said? Well, I, I'm not sure I can say that they're totally lacking in integrity. Well, are you saying well, they're just not I, too smart? No, I'm not saying that either. Well, what are I'm you say, saying? I'm saying that it is not in their interest necessarily to always tell you the truth. Uh, that is not, I mean, there are certain instances well, that, here. That's a lack of integrity. Yeah, yeah. Well, there are certain instances here where I think it's clear that they've been lying. Uh, for instance, uh, to, to say that there's only one AIDS virus. Well, there, there's really, that's really not right. There's a field effect. There are millions of different AIDS viruses. Every AIDS virus isolated to date is different. Again, if you made this virus or were responsible for its spread or had something to do with its spread, are you going to tell anybody? I think the answer is obviously no. Well, I, I agree with that. I mean, that, that assumes, though, that there uh, are either a very small number of individuals running the show or that... Uh, you're a very extraordinary person. Because well, there, there is no one else saying this. Well, that's not correct. There are many other people saying it. Uh, in it has been, it's been actually it's been discussed worldwide. It's only been recently that this question has been discussed in this country. Dr. John Seal of the Royal Society of Medicine has said that the virus appeared to be man-made in a sense long before we did, but he couldn't exactly construct how that may have occurred. We sort of gave him maybe the information on how the viruses could have been recombined to produce a new AIDS-like virus. Uh, Jacob Siegel, an East German biologist who said that the virus was constructed at Fort Detrick in a biological warfare project. Uh, again, if the virus is its own constructing agent and the virus could have arisen in any laboratory, at any time, more or less, since the development of human tissue culture, which arose in 1951 with the death of Henrietta Lacks, every laboratory in the world is suspect. And, of course, that makes all the scientists very nervous because they're gonna, they, they say, well, uh, I mean, I, I surely didn't come out of my laboratory. So, in essence, you're talking about a uh, Chernobyl of molecular biology in a sense. It's exactly correct. Actually, if you look at the predictions in testimony before Congress, the actual predictions was that a Chernobyl accident uh, or a Three Mile Island accident was predicted by a, a physicist to be something like one times ten to the minus eighteen. Uh, and the uh, chance that it would that happen. it would happen, right? Uh -huh. Whereas the chance of a biological accident of this nature was one times ten to the minus fourteen, or basically ten thousand times more likely to occur than either a Chernobyl or Three Mile Island. Dr. Strucker, how can you account for the spread of the AIDS virus in such a monumental amount uh, of cases in countries like Brazil or other parts of Latin America or Haiti. Right. It, again, the, I think the Haitian explanation is quite simple. If you look in the uh, May 11th, Monday, May 11th, 1987 article in the front page of the London Times, what's documented there is that at the time of the smallpox vaccination campaign of the World Health Organization in Africa in the mid-70s, 15,000 Haitians were in that program. In so in Africa, yeah. they were there working. 
So it's easy to see how Haitians may have been contaminated and then moved back to Haiti. That could explain the outbreak of AIDS in Haiti. Did they participate in the smallpox? Yes. 15, they 000, did? Yes, they did. 15,000 Haitians were in the smallpox. Campaign. Well, this is incredible. If, if in fact, the outbreak of AIDS corresponded with this, the smallpox vaccination right. situation in the mid-70s in Africa, everybody knows about that. Who, who did it? They should know the results. If, in fact, the Haitians were part of that and then went back to Haiti and, of course, you know, did what come naturally, and then, you know, Haitians seem to get it. If, in fact, a homosexual outbreak in America is tied into the hepatitis B vaccine uh, program initiated by, was that NIH? Uh, no, I, I, yeah, was, again, again, New York City, somebody. New York City Blood Bank. Was Don't these same things occur to the people who did it? I mean, why are you the only one that's making, that's making notice? It's so obvious. I'm not the only one. If it looks like a rose and smells like a rose... <laughs> It's, it's, it's actually pretty much a rose. Right. I mean, they, right. they've worked to correct situations based on flimsier evidence than this. So even if they didn't do it intentionally, I think the fact that they're avoiding dealing with this incredible coincidence is tantamount to, you know, criminal act also. Wouldn't you say? I mean, uh, well, again, I'm not the only one who has maintained that the virus may have come out of a laboratory. But you're the only one sitting here today. <laughs> yeah, we can. I mean, right. it's, it doesn't make any sense. Why are you the only one? Broad well, who else is broadcasting this? Certainly again, not the government. It should be obvious to them what's obvious to us sitting here. But again, if in fact you see that the people, like, let's look at the WHO, the World Health Organization. If, in fact, the smallpox campaign in Africa was responsible for the outbreak of AIDS, that's the last thing they're ever going to admit to. So why would you expect them to come because forward? Because the world's going to die, I and mean, everybody's going to die. That's why. I mean, they're humans, too. How are they going to protect themselves? Mm -hmm. They can't. I mean, according to your time schedule, in 20 years, Amer everybody in America, or less six years, everyone in America is infected. Could Within be. 14 to 20 years, we're all dead. That's, that's possible. The end of, that's the end of everything. Right. Well, that should get people upset. It should. You're getting me upset right now. I mean, hey, yeah. I mean, what you're saying is so incredible. We're sitting here very casually and cavalierly discussing it. But you're talking about the end of the world here. And the people well, who... Can... I'm not the only one talking about the end of the world. Uh, Dr. Hazeltine from Harvard has said in, before Congress that the AIDS virus alone, not taking into account HTLV 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, uh, 1 look alike, he said the AIDS virus by itself is species threatening. In other words, it has the ability to exterminate mankind. That's in the congressional record. Uh, obviously, we're on some kind of a countdown here. Somebody doesn't face up to it, or they don't develop a vaccine or some kind of right. help for it. Right. You say, I mean, I, I, mean, I have always maintained it's impossible. that there should be a, a, a multi-pronged approach, a crash Apollo type approach, which would include not only traditional uh, therapies like development of AZT and other drugs, but uh, development of alternative therapies, in a sense, alternatives like uh, laser therapies, the Rife techniques, and anything else that appears practical because as far as I can see, mankind is headed for extinction unless this virus is controlled. In Latin America and Asia, the disease seems to be spreading. It's yeah, Latin famous. America, particularly Brazil, uh -huh. the story goes that in Brazil, Brazil bought a lot of the blood that it was transfusing in the 70s from Africa. Oh, and so God, that would explain oh. how Brazil oh. might have incurred a tremendous uh, AIDS problem. The other problem is, of course, that there were IR or uh, WHO vaccine programs conducted in Brazil. You know, I'd like to get back to this question of culpability here. You said, you didn't suggest, you said that it was, uh, was it the Navy that, that paraded a steamship up and down the... Uh, uh, no, it was the department. It was, well, I don't know if it was, was a, it was a Navy vessel, but it was the a Navy of vessel that conducted... Actually it, sprayed... Teresia Marcesin's bacteria into San Francisco. On being a not telling San not Franciscans telling or anybody else. Right. Yeah. Infected everybody and right. they got, according to you, 5,000 no, units. that wasn't according to me. That was oh. according to the researcher I mean, who conducted what the study. Said, right. The researcher who conducted the study reported that uh, that is uh, written in Paxman and Harris, a higher form of killing, which is a review of biological warfare in this country. The researcher that conducted the study concluded that an average San Francisco resident inhaled 5,000 serratia marcescens bacteria during that project, which demonstrated that San Francisco was subject to uh, a biological warfare attack. All right. Well, anybody mm -hmm. else got something to say? Because, oh, sure. oh, go ahead. Is this an experiment that's gone out mm -hmm. of hand? Sure, that's fine. Except that, in a sense, we yeah. are the experiment. The whole world has become the, the experiment. And uh, the, every person on this planet is now the experiment. Well, I think rather than going back and 
trying to file criminal charges or anything well, like that. Well, that's Shouldn't impossible. Shouldn't we just leave that and just go on and try to... Well, sure, there are lots of people who say, or... well, it's not important where the virus came from, you know. Uh, let's just fix and it. Fix the fall, yeah, not the blame. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm... The story of the yeah. African, you know, who woke up one night with a lion in his bedroom. He chased it out. He didn't look for the open window where the lion came in. He crawled back and went, dead, went to sleep, and a tiger came in and ate him. So, you know, I don't believe <laughs> that you can say that it's not important where these things came from. It's extremely important. Okay, during the Middle Ages, uh, bubonic plague destroyed two-thirds of Europe, or whatever the percentage is, but a large percentage. Right. I believe it was two-thirds or three-quarters. Now, physicians, or so-called physicians, such as they were at that time, refused to treat patients. If the AIDS epidemic increases all of the proportions we've been discussing here today, how, where do you see the moral position of a physician who refuses to treat an AIDS patient? Although a lot of them are refusing right now. Right, right. I mean, that's how do you, would you, you want to comment on that? Or? Yeah, first off, it's uh, my own. Uh, do you treat AIDS patients? I do. I have 30 to 60 AIDS patients. And I, uh, <laughs> you have well, 30 to 60 AIDS yeah, patients? Yeah, yeah. And we treat them and we, um, um, I think we do very well in treating them. Uh, and I give them all kinds of options in addition to AZT. I don't exclude necessary alternative therapies or other, anything that might help them, I advise that they use. And that includes AZT. But um, what each person will decide for himself is uh, a difficult yeah. question. And each person has his own values and uh, makes his own decisions. Dr. Strecker, this is uh, apparently the last question we'll be able to ask because of time considerations. And I would like to propose this or suggest this to you and see what, what you have to say. There are a lot of people going to be watching this tape, hopefully, if it's a successful videotape. People who are neither homosexuals, neither from Africa, neither drug users or anything else, whose only exposure to the information about AIDS comes from the media or from the government or so-called experts. And they really haven't been too concerned about this. But after watching this tape, they might very well become you know, very concerned about this. And you have people that are trying to live normal lives. They are raising children. And a child, after all, in my opinion, is actually, among other things, a sign of faith that two people bestow upon humanity. They say, I'm bringing forth this child in the hopes and expectations that that child will live as good or as decent a life or better than they have had. With the prospect of what you're saying coming true in any part, what, do, what would you say to that person or those people or that couple watching this program? Well, you leave this? I would think that they have to continue on in their living as uh, if uh, what we predict in a sense is not necessarily the final uh, outcome. Uh, that is to say that it can't happen, but what I mean to say is that we have to work to make it not happen. Each person has to become involved individually. This virus threatens the existence of everyone on this planet. You have to become involved and determine for yourself whether or not what we're telling you is true or false. It doesn't take a rocket physicist to look out there and say, hey, there's a whole bunch of new diseases which all of a sudden seem to have popped up. And so people have to become involved and find out exactly what's going on. They should not just accept everything they're being told by the so-called AIDS expert in the government as absolute fact. You have to decide for yourself whether what we've told you is true or false and then become involved with your, your neighbors, your friends, your representatives, your senators, and your president. And if you do that, then hopefully we'll get to a solution. I think there is a solution. I've, uh, I've already illustrated what I think the solution to this problem is. But I think that this country, the whole world, has to address it in a crash program of many-pronged approach. As time passes, you will see more and more of Dr. Strecker's warnings and predictions come true. Unfortunately, at this time, there is no happy ending to this story. Assuming the government does not interfere with Dr. Strecker's work, there may be, just maybe some hope for us. Dr. Strecker and others that share his concerns are committing all their time, all their efforts, and all their resources to finding a solution and that includes exploring any conceivable alternative that might stop this disease instead of waiting for the drug companies to produce a miracle vaccine. Now, nobody is asking you for money. 
You've already contributed to this cause by purchasing this tape. But there are things you can do. To begin with, tell everyone you know about Dr. Strecker and his findings. Tell the politicians you elected that you're not satisfied with what you're being told. Tell them it doesn't make any sense to entrust the cure for this disease to the same people who may have started it in the first place. The same people who haven't found a cure for cancer after 40 years of trying. Mankind doesn't have another 40 years. Tell them that God gave you the gift of life, and now that gift is being threatened. Tell them that you want to live, that you want your children to live. Tell them now, before there's no one left.